So good day, welcome back to the channel and welcome to Divine Rebellions Part 3, Babel, the last of the Divine Rebellion series. So in the startup video, all right, in the startup title card for this video, we saw pyramids or pictures of pyramids from all over the world, from the Americas, from Europe, from the Middle East. And there are pyramids all over the world. The difference being what material the pyramid was made of. If the pyramid was made of stone, it lasts a long time. If the pyramids were made of mud, obviously they became a mound. But there are pyramids all over the world. Scientists even believe they found a pyramid in Antarctica under, under all that ice. So why are there pyramids all over the world? And what does that have to do with divine rebellions? We're going to ask a lot of whys in this video, and we're hopefully going to get some answers to all those whys. So let's go. So a couple of passages here. Reading from Genesis chapter 1 and verse 26. And God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them man is mankind man is not male let them have dominion over the fish of the sea over the birds of the air and over all livestock of our livestock and over all the earth and over all eretz in hebrew the earth isn't a planet the earth is, is all things physical so let man have dominion over all things physical, over the entire physical creation, over all of Eretz, and over every creeping thing on the ground. So the next passage is Psalm 115 and from, from chapter 6 and from verse 16, sorry. The heavens are the Lord's heavens, or the heavens are Yahweh's heavens, but the earth he has given to the children of man. So this shows that from the beginning, the earth, the physical creation, was given by Yahweh for man to have dominion over, for man to manage. Man is the ruler's, or in, in, in Yahweh's intention, man is the ruler's of the entire physical creation according to these passages that's what dominion is you are the ruler you are in control yes you answer to me but you are in control but there's something a little strange let's look at a couple more passages in first Corinthians chapter 2 we see None of the rulers of this age understood this, for if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 12. We wrestle not against flesh and blood. In other words, we wrestle not against, human and, um, against humanity, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Now, this was written by Paul 2,000 years ago. If we have to bring it forward into our modern language, it will say we don't wrestle against humanity, but against governmental structure. Principalities, powers, rulers of wickedness in dark places, 
um, rulers of the darkness of this world sorry and against spiritual wickedness in high places it's like saying presidents and prime ministers and mayors and sheriffs and magistrates it's a governmental structure but that governmental structure is not inhabited by human by humanity by flesh and blood let's look at dan chapter 10 and verse 12 then he said to me and the he being an elohim being an angel sent by god to daniel fear not daniel for from the first day that you set your heart to understand and humbled yourself before your god your words have been heard and i have come because of your words the prince of the kingdom of persia withstood me 21 days but michael one of the chief princes came to help me for i was left there with the kings of persia and from daniel chapter 10 and verse 20 then he said he being the same angel the same elohim that came to daniel do you know why i have come to you but now i will return to fight against the prince of persia and when i go out behold the prince of greece comes now the word prince is sir it's ruler so daniel had prayed to god right he had seen you know he had prayed to god for understanding of a certain uh, dream or set of dreams and god dispatched an angel an elohim and the angel was resisted by a bunch of people obviously it was the the sorry the angel wasn't resisted by a bunch of people the angel was resisted by intelligent beings obviously those intelligent beings are not human the prince or the sar the ruler of the kingdom of persia is not human michael came to assist the elohim which was Dan, which was gabriel but then you know he was there with the rulers of persia they were not human and he's now leaving to go fight against the sar the ruler of persia and then later he has to fight the prince the ruler of greece in the ephesians passage we see a whole governmental structure that's not inhabited by humans and finally in first corinthians talking about the crucifixion paul is saying that if the rulers of this age understood this they would not have crucified christ the lord of glory so these passages are showing that the rulers of this world are not human they are not human they are all divine beings they are all elohim but that is in stark contradiction to the passages we read before where god has given dominion of this creation of the eretz of the earth to man how did rulership of earth move from man to these divine beings to these elohim did God change it? Because we saw that it was God's intent from the beginning for man to have control over this physical creation. God made a physical creation and then he made physical intelligent life. And he called them his image or images, his agents, his ambassadors. And they were to have dominion. So how did this dominion move from man to these divine beings we got a lot of whys in this video let's go forward now i'm reading from genesis chapter 11 and from verse 1 and we are going to go to this passage over and over in this video so reading from chapter 1 
Now the whole earth had one language and the same words. And as people migrated from the east, they found a plain in the land of Shinar and settled there. And they said to one another, Come, let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone and bitumen for mortar. Then they said, Come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the heavens, and let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be dispersed over the face of the whole earth. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of man had built. And the Lord said, Behold, they are one people, and they have all one language. And this is only the beginning of what they will do. And nothing that they propose to do will now be impossible for, for them. Come, let us go down. Come, let us go down. So come, let us go down and there confuse their language so that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord dispersed them from there over the face of all the earth and they left off building the city. Therefore, it being the city, its name was called Babel. Because there, the Lord confused the language of all the earth. And from there, the Lord dispersed them over the face of the earth. Now, if we go right before this passage from Genesis 9. In Genesis 10, there's some genealogies. And if you go from before the passage, the last thing God said to man, this was right after the flood. And the last thing God said to the man, right, to the children, to the survivors of the flood, Noah and his children, the eight people that came out of the ark, the last thing God said to them is, have children and populate the earth. He told them, spread out. Spread everywhere. Spread out. And what do we see here? We see that they came to a lovely plain. It's in China. We know where that is. That's in Bab that's that that's Babylon. That's close to the Euphrates. So it's a nice, lovely plain, well watered. Right? There's a river very close, so there's access to water. It's nice and flat. Flat. It's good for planting. And they said, "We're gonna stay here. We're gonna build a city here." But God just told you spread out and all of them said no we're not spreading anywhere we're staying right here and this was the beginning of babylon initially called babel and this is the first mention in the bible of babylon now the first mention of anything is important is, is important in the bible we see babylon mentioned throughout scripture throughout the bible but this is the first mention of it. This is the founding of Babylon. Let's see one of let's look at one of the last mentions of Babylon in the Bible. Now I'm reading here from Revelation chapter 17. And from verse 1, this is the last book in the Bible. This is Revelation. This is the bookend. And reading from verse 1. Then one of the seven angels, who had the seven bowls, came and said to me, Come, I will show you the judgment of the great prostitute, who is seated on many waters, with whom the kings of the earth have committed sexual immorality, and with the wine of whose sexual immorality the dwellers on earth have become drunk. And he carried me away in the spiritual wilderness. And I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast that was full of blasphemous names. And it had seven heads and ten horns. The woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet and adorned with gold and jewels 
and pearls, holding in a hand a golden cup full of abominations and the impurities of her sexual immorality. And on her forehead was written a name of mystery, Babylon the Great, mother of prostitutes and of earth's abominations. Now, Revelation is full of symbology. Uh, in 2021, I had done a a commentary on Revelation. I'll eventually try to turn it into a series of videos. But Revelation is full of symbology. So the symbology here with Babylon the Great, the great city of Babylon, is called the mother of prostitutes and of abomination. Now, symbolically, anytime the Bible speaks of a woman, it is speaking, or at least symbology in, in prophecy, it's speaking about a belief system, a religion. So Israel was God's or is God's wife. When Israel was insistent on worshipping other deities, Israel was referred to as an unfaithful wife, as a harlot, as a whore. When they, when they, when they, when they worshipped Asherah and Baal and all the other gods of Canaan, the church is referred to as God's or as Christ's fiance. And at the end, Christ and the fiance has a marriage. Numerous women are referred to in the Bible, and when they are called prostitutes, it's talking about a false religion and when you see sexual immorality or fornication fornication and adultery it's worshiping other deities other than Yahweh so Babylon the Great being called the mother of prostitutes it means that Babylon was the source or the start or the foundation of all the false religions and false worship of the earth. Babylon was where men started to worship other deities, where men started to, you know, where the, the worship of all other deities started in Babylon. And if you go through a lot of cultures, there are gods who have changed their names. For example, the Ash, the Asherah, or Ash, or Ash, or, or, or Ashtaroth. I think I have that right. Ashtaroth in the Bible is the same deity as Astarte, the same deity as Isis from Egypt, and it's the same deity that it became Easter, the Germanic goddess of renewal and the spring. So. All of that started in Babylon. All the corruption started in Babylon. All of it. Let's go forward and see how. Before we do that, let's take a look at some things, at some pictures. This is a picture of Mount Nemrut in Turkey. This is the famous Mount Olympus. The head of the, you know, the home of the Greek gods, Mount Olympus in Greece. This is a mountain called the Ol Doinio Lengai in Tanzania. Hopefully, I did not butcher the name. And this is a picture of Spirit Mountain in the USA. Now, what do all of these pictures have? And and there are more. I just pulled out four. There are more, and it's all over the earth, in every continent in every culture what do all of them have in common all of them are the homes of the gods of various cultures throughout the earth everywhere men believe that gods live either on top of mountains 
inside mountains and a certain categories of, of God, meaning those who are in charge of the underworld, live under the mountain. As we saw in the last video, which was Divine Rebellions Part 2, Pan had a home under the mountain, and under the mountain was was the underworld, and at this was Mount Hermon, and there was a big um, cave, and that cave was the gateway to the underworld, the gates of hell, the gates of Hades. So all men everywhere in ancient times believed that their gods lived on mountains. Now, after I've spent years since my childhood reading about various mythologies and various cultures, I've come to the belief that all mythologies come from a particular and single source. They may have been corrupted over the time, but they come from a single source. They're all linked. They're all linked. They sh all share a single source because there are certain similarities in all of them. And one thing in all of them, they all believe that the gods lived on mountains. But does the Bible also say that? Let's take a look at something here. And I'm reading from Genesis chapter 2 and verse 10. And this is talking about Eden. It's a description of Eden. A river flowed out of Eden to water the garden. And there it was divided and became four rivers. The name of the first is Pishon. It is the one that flowed around the whole land of Havilah where there is gold. And the gold of that land is good. Bedellium and onyx stone are there. The name of the second river is Gihon. It is the one that flowed around the whole land of Cush. And the name of the third river is Tigris, which flows east of Assyria. And the fourth river is the Euphrates. Now what is important in this passage, describing Eden and talking about Eden, is that rivers start on mountains. Rivers, the source of rivers are all mountains. So a river flowed out of Eden, and there it divided and became four rivers, or it was the source of four rivers. Eden was a mountain. Yeah, we've missed that. There's a lot of things in the Bible that's just right under the surface. you got to dig a little bit. But Eden was a mountain where God came and met with man in the cool of the day, after man did whatever he had during the day and they discussed whatever they discussed, was a mountain. Eden is very important to God and is very important theologically. Eden is the future and I'll probably get to that. In fact, I'll definitely get to that in future videos. But what's important here is Eden was a mountain. Let's look at another passage. And reading Isaiah 14 from verse 12. How are you fallen from the heaven, O day star, son of the dawn? Or in Hebrew, Hillel ben Shakar. Or he may, or Lucifer, morning star. Depending on what version you're reading or what translation you're reading. How are you cut, how you are cut down to the ground? You who lay the nations low. You said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven above the stars of God or above the other Elohim of God. I will set my throne on high or above everyone else. I will sit on the mount of assembly in the far reaches of Saphon. And Saphon here would be translated in most places as sides of the north. I've spoken about Saphon already in one of the earlier videos. But Saphon is essentially, theologically, the throne of God. Or the throne room of God. And it's a mountain. The mountain of assembly or the mountain of the meeting of the gods or the mountain of the divine council. It's a mountain. So throughout scripture and throughout all cultures, gods live 
on mountains. When Moses had to go and see God face to face, he had to go up the mountain of Sinai. When, to this day, when Jews return to Israel or repatriate to Israel, well, not repatriate, they never lived there, or when they emigrate to Israel, it's called Aliyah, meaning it's called going up. Aliyah means to go up. What do they go up to? They go up the mountain. They go up. They come back to the Holy Land, which means they're rising. They're going up back to God. They're going back to meet God. Remember, they believe, the Jews who have not yet accepted Jesus, they believe that the land is holy. The land belongs to God. And there's a place in the land, on the temple, where God's presence is once there is a temple. So I am going back to be in the presence of God. So I am making a layer. I am going up the mountain. I will lift up my head to the hills from whence comes my, 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 my health. I will look up to God because my God is on a mountain. So it's universally believed by all cultures that God's lived on mountains. So we have to establish that. And we have established that. All cultures believed that God's homes were on mountains. You want to interact with deity, you go up the mountain or you go close to the mountain. Which is why at the foot of Mount Hermon, there was a temple from every belief and religion except the Jews at the foot of Mount Hermon, close to the gateway of the underworld, to the gates of hell, the gates of Hades, because those gods were on mountains. So I have to go there to interact with them. So humans, ancient humans, believed that the gods lived on mountains, that all gods lived on mountains. And so did the people in this passage. So let's go forward. So we come back to this passage. I said we're going to be in this passage all day. So God has told them, let's, I want you to go spread out, have lots of children and spread out and take control or, or, or fill the earth, not take control, fill the earth. Have lots of children spread out and fill the earth with humans. They, however, decided, we're going to settle right here. We're not going anywhere. We are settling right here. We're going to build a city. We're going to make bricks. We're going to fire them, you know, make them hard. And we're going to make nice concrete buildings. And we're going to stay here. We are not going to travel in tents as nomads we're going to stay here all of us we're going to make a name for ourselves lest we be dispersed so they were a little concerned about being dispersed by Yahweh so growing up we were told that the tower was made to protect them from a flood so that they could go into a, go into a tower and that tower would be tall enough to reach heaven where God is. Because for some strange reason, we believe that ancient people were imbeciles. The ancients did not believe that they could build a tower or a skyscraper that would reach up into the heavens. They didn't believe that. There's not what the passage is saying. This passage is saying something else. Let's keep going. So, God wanted them to all stay, or not all stay, sorry. God wanted them to spread out. He wanted them to spread out. They decided they're not doing that. Now, after this incident, we see other gods. 
immediately after this passage. In fact, immediately after this passage, with Babel, we see Abraham being called by God. And what was Abraham's father? Abraham's father was a manufacturer of idols. We don't see idols before. We don't see any other gods before. We see gods after. So Babel was the start of what some commentators like to refer to as divine geography, where various gods have control over various lands or various countries or various geographies, as we saw in the passage from Daniel a bit earlier. Let's read Deuteronomy 32 and from verse 8. Now I'm first reading from the King James here. When the Most High divided, the, divided to the nations their inheritance, when he separated the sons of Adam, or Beni Adam, meaning human beings, he set the bounds or the boundaries of the people according to the number of the children of Israel. For the Lord's portion of his, is his people. Jacob is the lot of his inheritance. Now, this does not make sense. This passage doesn't make sense. Obviously, based on the passage we just read in Genesis 11, the dividing of the nations happened at Babel. There wasn't an Israel yet. Abraham wasn't born yet. And Abraham was Israel's grandfather. So they obviously were not children of Israel. So if God divided the nations according to their inheritance, if, if God divided the nations, sorry, according to the number of the children of Israel, which by the way were 12, he couldn't do that yet because they weren't, Israel wasn't born. Abraham wasn't born. You could pick up and say, all right, God knows the end from the beginning. Okay. But he divided the people according to the number of the children of Israel. The number of the children of Israel were 12. Further along in this passage, it says that the number of the nations divided was 70 or 72, depending on translation. So that's a next you know, contradiction. But this was reading from the King James. There's something we have to understand about any translation of the Bible. And I am not particularly partial to, I mean, I have a preference. Most of my um, quotes will be coming from the ESV, but that's my preference. But People are free to choose what translation, once you study it right, and once you understand that in studying the Bible, you have to study the Bible through the lens of language, culture, time, history. So you got to dig all into that. So when I'm studying the Bible, I'll take a passage, and then I'll go through every word of that passage, and I'll have a concordance, and I'll look at what the original that is translated what those words and those phrases were to try to understand what the biblical writer was trying to say. Because the Bible was written for us, definitely. The Bible was not written to us. It was written to a different audience a long time ago. And that audience existed in a different language, in a different time, and in a different culture. So first we have to understand what the writer was trying to say, and then we will know how it applies to us. Because if we try to sometimes take exact take it, you know, exactly how it is and apply it into our culture, we're going to take things out of context. Alright? The, 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 in fact, God doesn't even say really read the Bible in most cases. He says, study it. He says, study it. So, let me read that same passage from Deuteronomy 32, 8. When the Most High gave to the nations their inheritance, when he divided mankind, he fixed the borders of the people according to the numbers of the sons of God. Because the original 
word translated there in the King James as children of Israel is Beni Elohim. Beni Elohim. <laughs> Elohim doesn't mean Israel. Elohim means gods or God. So he fixed the borders of the people according to the numbers of the sons of God. But the Lord's portion or the Lord's territory or Yahweh's territory is his people, is Israel, Jacob, his allotted in heritage or the part of the earth that he allotted to himself. Any translation of the Bible into any modern language, whether English, Spanish, whatever, it is an effort in, you know, um, it's an effort in faith, it's an effort in, you know, scholastic ability, but it's also an effort in politics and in understanding. Now, at the time this was translated into King James, one, the doctrine was only one God existed. Now, I've shown in a previous video that that doctrine is false. Nowhere in the Bible is there belief that one God existed. There's only one God that should be worshipped but there are many Elohim there are many gods that exist so the passage saying sons of God can't be right so let's translate it instead into children of Israel there was also the contradiction of if we say sons of God, there's also the, the, the problem, I should say, that if we say sons of God, if we translate this into sons of God in the King James, this goes against and contradicts the Bible that says God gave his only begotten son. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Christ is God's only begotten son. And that problem came about because of a misunderstanding or, or lack of understanding of language. The New Testament was written in Greek, in Koine Greek. At the time of translating, some of the nuances of Koine were not very well understood. So the word that's translated as only begotten that Christ is God's only begotten son the word in Greek is monogenesh and they believed it meant only drawn out or only born so Christ is God's only drawn out or only born son so obviously if we say that there are the sons of God then there's something wrong here However, that's not what monogonesh you know, generally means. 300 years prior to the birth of Christ, there was an effort to create or to translate the Hebrew Old Testament into Greek. Because at wrong this time, this is after Alexander had conquered you know, those, those regions, he had died already. And those regions were under the control, depending on where you were, of, you know, Greek rulers. Whether it's the Seleucids in the Middle East or, or, or the, um, I can't remember the name of the people, or the Potelmies in Egypt or the others. But the region was under control of the Greeks. Everyone spoke Greek. So an effort was made to translate the Bible into Greek. And this method was called, this effort, sorry, was called the Septuagint. It's called the Septuagint because it was believed that 70 of the most learned scholars were used to translate the Hebrew text into Greek. Septuagint, 70. And in the Septuagint, the past, there's a passage from Genesis 22:16, and this passage is around when God told Abraham 
to bring his son Isaac to the Akedah and sacrifice him. And Abraham was obedient. And just before Abraham plunged the knife, God said, hold your hand. And from chapter 16, it says, and you know, and God said, by myself, I have sworn, declares the Lord, because you have done this and not withheld your son, your only son. The word that the, the, the translators of the Septuagint used in 300 BC for only son was monogenish. Same word used in the New Testament for only begotten, monogenish. The issue here is that Isaac was not Abraham's only born son. Isaac wasn't even Israel, um, Abraham's first son. Ishmael was. And after Isaac, after Sarah died, Abraham went on, according to the Bible, to have other sons. So only begotten or only drawn out or only born does not qualify with Isaac. So it cannot mean, monogenesh cannot mean only born or only begotten. And it doesn't. It actually, mono Ganesh, mono means single or only, and Ganesh actually comes from the word from which we get type or kind. So mono Ganesh does not mean only begotten. Mono Ganesh means only type or one of a kind or unique. So Isaac was Abraham's one of a kind, monogamish, only type or unique son because he was the only son of an old barren woman. Abraham was married to Sarah. And unlike in modern times, Abraham didn't get married. Abraham and Sarah probably didn't get married in the 20s or 30s. That wasn't the culture. The culture was they're going to get married as teenagers. So they were married young. There was no contraception. There was no birth control. And all these years, Sarah never had children, so she was barren. And when she became old, she had Isaac. So Isaac was a special in that he was unique. Ishmael was born to, 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 to Hagar. Hagar was young. She wasn't barren. Isaac was the unique. Out of all the children that Abraham had, Isaac was unique because he was the child of a woman who shouldn't or couldn't have children. So, the same way is, um, Isaac was Abraham's unique son, Jesus is Yahweh's unique son. And he's Yahweh's unique son for a couple of reasons. One of them is that he's Yahweh. He is the visible Yahweh. Prior to Christianity, or Christianity being influential, Judaism believed in more than one Yahweh. They believed that there was a spirit of Yahweh called the Ruach HaKodesh, or Spirit the Holy, literal translation, and they believe in the Ruach HaKodesh to this day. But they believed that there was an invisible Yahweh, and they believed that there was a visible Yahweh. And it's all throughout the Bible. I'll probably do a video on that. It's all throughout the Bible. They stopped talking about that after Christ. Because Christ claimed to be Yahweh himself. So they moved away from that. But back to this passage. 
So when God gave the nations their inheritance, or when God split up the nations, he fixed the boundaries, or the boundaries of their countries, or the boundaries of the people, according to the number of the sons of God. This would seem to state that it was God who gave people over to other gods. And this is this is not completely the case. God didn't give people over to other gods. He permitted it. He, or he allowed it. But why would God allow something that he does not want? Because he's never wanted it. He wants people, the people he made, to answer to him, not to answer to other deities, but why would God do something and give people something that he does not want? Is there precedent for that? Does, does that how God operates? And the answer is, yeah. God gives, God is a gentleman. So God gives people what they want. In fact, the only people that God withholds things from would be his people who trust and believe in him. Because sometimes some of what we want is actually terrible for us and it will destroy us. But God gives people what they want. Remember, God gave dominion of this earth to man. Anything that happens on this earth that God wants happens with the involvement of men. The last time you see God doing anything by himself on this earth was before he made man in Genesis. But let's look at a passage where God allowed something that he did not want. There are many, but let's look at just this one. And I'm reading from 1 Samuel here, chapter 8 and verse 1. When Samuel became old, he made his sons judges over Israel. The name of his firstborn son was Joel, and the name of his second, Abijah. They were judges in Beersheba. Yet his sons did not walk in his ways, but turned aside after gain. They took bribes and perverted justice. Then all the, all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah and said to him, Behold, you are old and your sons do not walk in your ways. Now appoint for us a king to judge us like all the nations. Appoint for us a king to judge us like all the nations. That's what it wanted. But this thing displeased Samuel when they said, Give us a king to judge us. And Samuel prayed to the Lord. And the Lord said to Samuel, Listen to this again. And the Lord said to Samuel, Obey the voice of the people in all that they say to you. For they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me from being king over them. They have not rejected you, they have rejected me. According to all the deeds that they have done, from the day I brought them up out of Egypt even to this day, forsaking me and serving other gods, so they are also doing to you. Now then, obey their voice. Only you shall solemnly warn them and show them the ways of the king who shall reign over them. So the people didn't want judges. 
the judges were supposed to answer to God or answer to the prophets. So the judges usually worked in hand in hand with the prophets. Right? And they were leadership over the land. The land didn't have a king. Israel at this time, there was more like a bunch of little individual hamlets. What they shared was belief in not, not even belief in one deity because every now and then prior to Babylon prior to the Babylonian captivity, Israel always always chased after other, other deities, after other gods. But they had this shared culture. They followed Yahweh, but they also brought in others. When Yahweh said, follow me and follow me alone. But now they're saying, we want a king like everybody else around us, like all our neighbors. God didn't want this. Because God had intention of giving them a king that would lead to Christ. God always had intention of giving them David as their king. And one of the descendants of David would be Jesus. But they insisted. So what God said to Samuel, give them what they want. Just warn them. Show them what Saul will do to them. Show them that he will overtax them. Show them that he will take their sons and draft them into his armies by force if necessary. Show them that he will take his dead daughters and and and. and and make their daughters his servants. Show them all the abuses that Saul will do. And if they still agree, then yeah, go ahead. So God said to Samuel, give them what they want. It's not what I want, but it's what they want. You see, God is a gentleman. And God made us to be his image his images his ambassadors god does not rule over anyone by force he rules over everyone by choice everything is about choice the choices you make and he forces no one to make the choice but of course choices have consequences good consequences and bad consequences so we see in this passage that god didn't want this that god didn't want this as israel's future but israel chose this so in the same way god didn't particularly want men over anybody else that's what men wants that's what men wanted and still want to this day to be honest let's go forward so we come back to this passage. Now the whole earth had one language and the same words. And going forward to, to verse 3, and they said to one another, Come, let us make brick and burn them thoroughly. Let's make a city. Let's make a stable, permanent place. God wants us to spread. We're not going to spread. We're going to stay right here. Let's Build for ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the heavens. Now remember I said they didn't they, they weren't fools. They didn't believe that they could build a tower that reached up to where God is. No, they did that's not what they believed. So top in the heavens means something else. And let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be dispersed over the face of the earth. So what they wanted was in direct opposition of what Yahweh wanted and they knew this because that's what they were afraid of we don't want to be dispersed over the earth no logically they don't know what's what what the earth is like the earth is the great unknown they know what this plane of China is like and it's lovely it's beautiful it will become prosperous it's good for agriculture we could set up a city we will we'll be great we'll be fed we we'll have water we'll have food we can plant but it's not what god wants so god is bad in their minds god is bad right now this is great but god wants us to 
you know god wants to send us into the unknown that's bad but in life it's about the long game you either play the long game or you play the short game as you get older you realize it was better playing the long game as a child you will much prefer to 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 play sports or play outside all day as opposed to reading or doing schoolwork as you get older you realize it's much better it's not that reading or doing schoolwork is wrong in itself but if you do that you will not be able to take care of yourself and a family as an adult as an adult so as a parent you teach the children that hey you can't see this but the long game is better so the child has to humble and we have to humble but they didn't these people didn't grasp that they didn't grasp that on the plains of shana they wanted to build a city stay there and their defense of that city the defense of their idea was to build a tower with its top in the heavens and make a name for themselves otherwise Yahweh could scatter them over the face of the earth. Now let's look at the word Babel and Babylon. The Bible in the passage lower down it says that Babel means confusion. Now we have to understand there are names that start out meaning one thing and end up meaning something else language changes so eventually Babel came to mean destruction but that's not what it initially meant that's not what it originally meant now Hebrew is a Semitic language like other Semitic languages such as Aramaic or Arabic and Babel if you go to its roots in all of those languages mean the same thing it does not mean confusion it's actually two words bab meaning gate or door and el meaning god now babylon in its original is bab elim so babel the plural of babel would be bab elim and same thing bab means gate and elim means god so babel means the gate of god and babylon or babylim means the gate of the gods what does this have to do with mountains with pyramids all of that we're getting there we're getting there but the name of this city didn't mean confusion the name of this city meant gate of the god or gate of the gods what did they do there let's keep going now these are photos of different pyramids this here on the top right would be pyramids in Egypt we've seen those before next to it on the top left would be a pyramid in, in the Americas right like the Aztecs or the Mayans so there's a pyramid in the Americas lower down here would be a pyramid in, uh, would be a, a pyramid is actually called a ziggurat from the area of Babylon or the area of Mesopotamia in fact most people believe that the Tower of Babel would have been a ziggurat would have probably looked something like this right so men they use different construction techniques they use different they, you know they adapted as they got older or as they as they got to know better they use different construction materials but the idea was the same now all of these all these pyramids 
our towers. And we see here the Hebrew word for tower is Migdal. Right, let's talk about Migdals and towers and pyramids. So, the passage it says, Come, let us build for ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the heavens. And let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be dispersed over the face of the earth. So I've already stated, their goal is not to be dispersed. They were afraid of being dispersed. Their goal was the opposite of that. Their intention was to stay in that city, but they needed some defense. They completely knew and totally knew that Yahweh wanted them to disperse. But they decided they're not going to do that, but they needed a defense against what Yahweh wants. So let's look at that defense. Now I stated before, the word translated tower, right? This word translated, in the original word that is translated tower is Migdal. All right? So the Tower of Babel, the Migdal of Babel any tall structure right with its top in the heavens now the word translated top is rosh what does rosh means rosh comes from a hebrew root meaning to shake but to shake your head so rosh generally anywhere you see head in the old testament is rosh but it's not head like the head of a spear. That's a different word. Or the head or top of a building. That's a different word. Rosh means captain, chief, ruler, head. It means the person who is in charge or the person who is above. So let us build a tower with its chief or ruler in the heavens that's what they intended to do they do not want to be dispersed yahweh in heaven wants to disperse them so let us build a city and build a tower migdal now if we haven't grasped it yet a tower a migdal a ziggurat a pyramid is an artificial mountain gods lived on mountains so let us build a city and in that city let us build our own mountain that we made so we can control we can control access and therefore we can control whoever is the deity that takes control over that mountain. But let's go a little further. So let's build a tower and, you know, let's build a mountain, an artificial mountain with its head in the heavens. Or let's build an artificial mountain for an Elohim, for a deity. And let us make a name for ourselves. All right. So I said before, Rosh means the head, the chief, the captain, or the ruler. Now to make a name, the word make there is Asa. Now Asa means to make or to form or to fashion. But Asa also means to commit to something. Right? Asa means to commit to something, and Asa can also mean to a point. So let us build a city. Let us make an artificial mountain, and the deity, with a deity in charge of that mountain, a deity we can control, and let us appoint a name for ourselves. 
Now, the word name is originally in the Hebrew Shem, right? Like Shem, the son of 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 um, of Noah. So let's get a bit more into into Shem, into the name. All right, let's let's get into that into what it means to make our na- ourselves a name so remember the goal is we are staying here we know yahweh wants us to disperse we know we have no intention of listening to what yahweh wants so we are going to build an artificial mountain and we are going to a point on that mountain a deity we're going to make a name. We're going to appoint a name. Let's see what a name is. So I'm, not, I'm going to talk first about the name. All right? Now, this here is Yahweh in Hebrew. Yod, He, Vav, He. In English, if we turn it into English, into letters that we would recognize, right? It will be this, Yahweh, the Tetragrammaton. Anywhere in the Bible that you see the Lord, it's the Tetragrammaton. Right, so anywhere we see the Lord, it's the Tetragrammaton. yod He, vav He. It's pronounced or... You'll hear me say Yahweh, and so some translations you may see it as Yahweh, a bunch of others you may see it as Jehovah. Now, what's the difference between Jehovah and Yahweh? Um, None really, but the thing is with Hebrew, Hebrew only shows the consonants. The, the vowels are given in vowel points that may or may not be lost. So there is some debate on how the tetragrammaton is pronounced. It is closely, it is, is generally believed to be Yahweh. But at the time of um, translation into the King James and earlier translation, it was translated as Jehovah. Why Jehovah instead of Yahweh? Well... At the time of the translation, English was very close to its Germanic roots. And there is not a why at that point. J made the Y sound. So when you see Jehovah, initially it was meant to be pronounced as Yehovah. Joshua was supposed to be pronounced as Joshua. Jesus as Jesus. Does it matter? No. Not at all. Now, am I not contradicting a bunch of people? Am I not contradicting people? No, I'm not really. Now, before I get into why I'm not contradicting people, Around the year 300 BC, 300 years before Christ. Now, this is after the Babylonian captivity. Israel realized or they understood that they went into captivity because of their insistence on worshipping other deities. So they went to the other end of the spectrum and got overly religious. So, from around 300 AD, they stopped using the name Yahweh. They stopped pronouncing it. Based on a kind of superstition and a misunderstanding of the commandment where you shall not bear the name in vain. Now, bearing the name in vain does not mean to pronounce it. It means be a proper imager be a proper agent be a proper ambassador do not bear the name in vain do not bring shame to the name but bring glory to the name 
But what Israel did is outside of the high priest on the Day of Atonement on Yom Kippur, when he would go into the Holy of Holies and he will say the name in there, they wouldn't use the name. So they would use a bunch of other things. They will use Adonai, meaning Lord. They will use Ha'adir, meaning the mighty. But a lot of the times, up to the day, they will use Hashem. The name. That's what Hashem means, the name. So if you look at any Jewish documentary or Jewish movie, before, at least the very the religious ones, before they eat, they would say, Baruch Hashem, bless God, bless Yahweh, bless the name. Even in Jesus' times, um, there are times you will see in the Gospels, one of the names that also called Yahweh is heaven. So there are times you'll see a, a, a a passage with Jesus giving a parable about the kingdom of God. And there may be, be a next gospel. You'll see the same passage, but the writer puts it down as the kingdom of heaven. It means the same thing. It means Yahweh. So in Egyptian, and sorry, not Egyptian. So in Hebrew minds, a name is a deity, the power of a deity that's what the name is the name of the lord the name of yahweh is a strong tower the righteous run into it and they are saved the name is the power now why did i say that it doesn't matter if you choose to pronounce it yahweh or jehovah if you choose to pronounce there's a group or the groups that will go around saying you have to say the proper name of God. So you have to course say the person is Yahweh or whatever, and you have to say the name of Jesus as Yeshua. You have to use his Jewish name. That's that's non biblical and nonsense. The name isn't how you pronounce the name. When they say the, the name of the Lord is a strong tower, they didn't write the name on a building or write the name on the ground and run and stand up on top of it. They were talking about the power. Does the Bible back up what I say? Or does what I say have biblical backing? Yeah. Let's look at Exodus 6. So God spoke to Moses and said to him, I am the Lord. I am Yahweh. I appeared to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob as God Almighty, as El Shaddai. All right. El Shaddai means a little more than God Almighty, but for let's keep it simple. So I appeared to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as El Shaddai, but by my name, Yahweh, but by my name, the Lord, Yahweh, I did not make myself known to them. I also established my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan, the land in which they lived as sojourners or as nomads or as Bedouin. Now, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob did not know Yahweh. And by the way, Yahweh means I will be what I will be, or I will be what I need to be, or I will become what I need to become. I am that I am. That's what Yahweh means. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob did not know it. They didn't know the name. But although they did, they did not know the name and they just knew him as El Shaddai, he made covenant with them. A covenant that lasted a day. A covenant that he is working on to this day. And a covenant that will last till the end. Jesus returns to this earth based on that covenant. 
and they didn't know his name. They didn't know Yahweh. He established the covenant with them. And what does that covenant? That covenant was to give them the land of Canaan. A land in which they were nomads. They, they had no permanent abode. They were vagrants in the land of Canaan. Travelers passing through. So they didn't know the name. And God interacted and made covenant with them. Why God chose to give the name to Moses so that they know it now? My personal belief is because God does not God doesn't share his glory. And God wants everyone to know who he is and what he does. Everyone. God is speaking to Moses. And if you look at the beginning of the passage, God told Moses all that's going to happen. You're going to ask Pharaoh for the people to go. Pharaoh is not going to allow it. So there's going to be conflict between me and Pharaoh. The Exodus is conflict literature. The Exodus is a tale of a conflict, not between the Israelites and the Egyptians. It's the tale of a conflict between Yahweh and the gods of Egypt. Egypt had many, many gods. But if you look at the Exodus, that conflict was between Yahweh and those gods. There were primary gods in charge of certain things. And every one of those certain things, Yahweh attacked directly, thus showing I have nullified those gods. I am Lord over those gods. There were gods to cause the sun to... to, 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 to to rise, there were gods for fertility, there were gods that kept the desert at bay, there were gods for all of them, and God or oh, Yahweh attacked all of them. Yahweh even attacked Pharaoh. Now, what people don't understand or may not know is that Pharaoh, the Pharaohs, were considered as gods to, to, to Egyptians. Every night, the god that ruled the sun, Ra. When the sun set, the Egyptians believed that the God descended down to the underworld to do battle with the God of the underworld to maintain order in the land of the Nile. So when the sun went down, Ra went down and did battle. And it was a pitched battle because the God of the underworld was powerful. And... At, at, at the dawn, the battle was still going on. So Ra needed help. So to help Ra, the Pharaoh will come out and lend his strength to Ra. How did he lend his strength to Ra? Before the dawn, he would come out, go stand in the, in the Nile and masturbate and ejaculate into the Nile, thus lending his strength to Ra. To overcome the God of the underworld. And then Ra would raise the sun in the morning. Yahweh attacked and destroyed all of that. And then Yahweh was going to bring the people into the promised land. Into Canaan. Canaan was an empty. So there would be conflict. And who would this conflict be with? This conflict will be with the inhabitants of Canaan. Now, geopolitics then is like geopolitics now. Geopolitics existed. So now there are large countries or very powerful countries, and they have a bunch of smaller countries that were aligned to them. During the Cold War, there was a system that People have forgotten about, so they use it wrong. Right now, they'll talk about first world and third world countries based on, I don't know, the country's GDP or the, 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 the wealth of the country or, you know, the perceived wealth of the country as first world or third world. That's not what those terms originally meant. What those terms first world, in fact, you'll notice these days you don't hear about second world, you hear about first world and third world. Initially, those terms had to do with political alignment. Countries that were first world were aligned with the United States. 
It had nothing initially to do with the wealth. In fact, South Korea, which was unite, which was which was aligned with the United States, was sufficiently poorer than North Korea. So it wasn't about money. So first world were countries aligned with the United States. Second world, <coughs> excuse me, second world were countries aligned with the Soviet Union. So all those Warsaw Pact nations were second world. Cuba was second world. China was a second world country, at least until the 60s with the Sino-Soviet split. And the third world were the non-aligned countries. So India, excuse me, there's a plane passing or a helicopter passing, flying kind of low. So, so India, um, parts of South America, the Caribbean, Africa, they were not aligned. They were part of the non-aligned movement. So they were third world. And the same way that there were geopolitical alliances then, um, now there were geopolitical alliances then. So Canaan and those bunch of small states in Canaan were mostly aligned with the great power of Egypt. And that great power of Egypt had rivals. They had rivals like the Mitanni and Akkadians, etc. But so, so, so what did Yahweh do? Now, initially, in the passage here, it says that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob knew him as El Shaddai. Now, El Shaddai, El came to mean to be a noun, but initially it was a proper name for a particular deity. So if you're saying El, you can be talking about a particular deity, or you could be talking about a number of Mesopotamian deities. Yahweh wanted people to know that they're talking about him. Now, a little while, 50 to 100 years after the Exodus, we start seeing correspondence in Mesopotamia and Egypt. <clears throat> Among that correspondence would have been the Amara letters. The, sorry, not the Amara. The Amana letters. And the Amana letters were letters written in cuneiform sent by states in the Levant to the pharaohs in Egypt because the states in the Levant were aligned to Egypt and, and thus protected by Egypt. They would have sent Egypt tribute and when they're in trouble, Egypt may or may not have sent troops to help defend them. So they sent a bunch of, 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 of letters and in some of those letters, they were talking about send us help. We are under attack by people. Some of those people they call the Habiru. Now Habiru means dusty or dirty. And we know some we know today that definitely Habiru basically comes from the same um, language meaning as Hebrew. All right? We also know that the Habiru, at least some of the Habiru would have been people of Israel. However, there's a second name that they use for those invaders. Let me get closer. The rain has come down. There's a second word they use for those invaders. And that second word that they use was the Shasu. Now, Wow, this rain is coming down really hard. Now, Shasu means nomad. Shasu is an Egyptian borrowed word. It's actually borrowed from Semitic languages. And it means nomad or wanderer or Bedouin. But these people that were attacking these um Egyptian client states in the Levant, they were called the Shasu of Yahweh. The nomads of Yahweh were attacking us. Send us help. 
because the nomads of Yahweh are attacking us. Now we will remember after Israel left Egypt, they wandered the wilderness. They wandered the wilderness for 40 years and thereafter they then started the conquest of the promised land of Canaan. And they took quite some time doing that conquest. In fact, some of the last cities of the conquest like Jerusalem was conquered hundreds of years after. So Yahweh is my personal belief. Yahweh wanted to make sure that people know who is doing this. So if they said the Shasu of El, which El? Who El? Which one? Dagon? Which one? Which? Who is El? Which one of the gods? Is it Dagon? Is it is it Baal? Is it Marduk? Is it Chemosh? Which one of the gods? But when you say the Shasu of Yahweh, you know exactly the wanderers of, Nami, of Yahweh, the, 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 the nomads of Yahweh. You know exactly who is doing this. Who is doing this attack. So let's go forward. So back to this passage. So... Going back down to verse 4, let us build ourselves a city, a city that we know that Yahweh doesn't want us to do. Yahweh doesn't want us to stay here. Yahweh wants us to spread. Some of us can stay here, but we all are going to stay here. But Yahweh wants us to spread over the whole face of the earth. So we need defense against that. So we are going to build a tower. And that tower we're going to build an artificial mountain and that mountain will have a divine head which we will appoint we will make a name we will aser a shem we will make a name we will appoint a powerful deity to defend us so that we don't have to be spread over the face of the earth. So we are going to appoint a God over us other than Yahweh. What Yahweh wants, we don't want. So let us get another God and appoint that God over ourselves. Because we have no intention of doing what Yahweh wants. No, this, this video is called Divine Rebellions. And thus far I've only spoken about what humans have done. That humans built this city, humans made this artificial mountain, this Migdal, this pyramid, this ziggurat. And humans decided that they are going to place themselves under a god. What rebellion the divine beings have the rebellion that the divine beings committed is that they answered what happened at Babel is these people made the city they made this tower and they then tried to invoke or call deities to themselves now I'm going to go off on a slight tangent here. This is why, as people who believe in God, you do not call anything or try to call or command or speak to anything other than Yahweh. The Bible states, don't try to contact a medium don't try to contact a necromancer or a soothsayer. In other words, don't try to talk to your dead relatives or any dead humans. And don't try to talk to any spirits. Why is that? Only talk to Yahweh. Why is that? Simple. Anybody who answers you will be disloyal to Yahweh. Yahweh only wants us as his images 
to have contact with him. If anybody else responds to you, it would be beings who are disloyal to Yahweh. And if they are disloyal to Yahweh, they do not have your best interests at heart. So don't go talking. See, I've, I've, I've heard some pastors saying you can command angels. No, you don't. <laughs> no, you don't. But when they aren't you being contradictory, don't we see angels helping people in the Bible? Yeah. But they are not at the people's command. They are at Yahweh's command. Daniel was praying and God sent an Elohim. God sent an Elohim. Daniel wasn't commanding him. In fact, when he reached, he started to, to, to worship the Elohim. The Elohim said, no, 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 don't do that. Don't do that. The only person who takes worship would be Yahweh or someone that's disloyal to Yahweh. So don't go calling angels. Don't go praying to Michael or Gabriel or whatever. Don't go praying to Saint this or Saint that. They're all dead. Don't go praying to Mary. She's dead. Pray only to Yahweh. He's alive. Even when Yahweh decided to, 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 to become a man and live with us for a while and he died, he came back alive. Call him. Only speak to the living. Do not speak to the dead. Because who answers you will be impersonating who you think it is. When Saul went to the witch at Endor, and Saul said, "Bring me up so and so, bring me up Saul, bring me up um, Samuel." When Samuel came up, the witch was terrified. Why? She was accustomed bringing up people, but she was accustomed bringing up people who were impersonating who you were. This time, she bring up somebody who was actually the person. That person would have only risen because Yahweh rose them up. The Bible says, call only Yahweh, call only Yahweh. Stay away from doing that stuff. Stay away from, that's why you'll notice the Bible is very, very, very devoid of incantations and magic words and, 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 and chanting and all the things you use to invoke and call deities. This is what they did at Babel. And what did God do? God split them up. And God said, okay, you don't want to listen to me. You have stated that you don't listen to me. Okay. The deities you call, okay, you listen to them. You listen to them. You answer to them. But what is the next thing we see in the Bible after, after, after Babel? We see the call of Abraham. So men decided they are not going to do what Yahweh wants. But Yahweh has an agenda. Yahweh has a plan and that plan must be, you know, that plan must come to pass. So what did God did? God created his own people. He went to Ur, modern day Iraq, and called a guy named, named, named Abraham. And he built a people out of Abraham. He tell the people, stay separate so that people will know, yeah, you are the same race or look like the same people around you, but stay separate. Don't wear the clothes they like to wear. You'll notice after Jake, after, you know, Joseph and his, and his, you know, many colored clothes, which Basically, what clothes Semites used to wear. They used to wear multicolored tunics. You noticed after that, Yahweh told them, okay, dress kind of monochromatic. It wasn't because Yahweh hated color. No. Yahweh created lots of diversity and lots of colors in nature. No. Yahweh wanted these people to stick out from those around them. So though these people wear multi-dyed, multicolored clothing. You wear plain 
simple color clothing one color so these days you see jews they're black and white they're very monochromatic because they missed it god wanted his people to be holy what holy means is unique separate different because god had his plans so those elohim that these people put them under they are still sons of god and they were still supposed to do something they weren't supposed to answer but they answered but they still had duties let's go forward this is psalm 82 this is probably my favorite psalm in the entire bible all right God has taken his place in the divine council. Elohim Nisa Bahadat El. God has taken his place in the council of the Els, in the council of the divine, in the midst of the God he holds judgment. And then he lays down his indictment. How long will you just unjustly? How long will you judge unjustly? And show partiality to the wicked. This is what I want you to do. And this is what God wants all of us to do. When men regain the earth, this is what God would have us do. If you're in government, this is what your job is. Give justice to the weak and the fatherless. Maintain the right of the afflicted or the weak and the destitute rescue the weak and the needy deliver them from the hand of the wicked they have neither knowledge nor understanding they walk about in darkness meaning teach them mean it means teach them it means share knowledge this is what we have to do we have to teach people we have to share knowledge all the foundations of the earth are shaken meaning i'm going to change everything I'm going to mash up all the structures. I'm going to destroy all the structures. And this is God saying, I said, you are gods. Sons of the Most High, all of you. Nevertheless, like men, you shall die. And you shall fall like any prince or ruler. It ends, arise, O God. Judge the nation, judge the earth for you shall inherit the nations jesus job is to fix every one of these three rebellions the first rebellion saw death introduced to the earth death introduced the first rebel in akash the serpent he introduced he got death introduced so death entered into the earth and death entered into mankind what did jesus do jesus yahweh taken flesh came and allowed himself to die he became a curse so all the curses that were on him once we are loyal to Yahweh, the, all the curses who are on that are on us, that were placed on us, were placed on Him. He redeemed us of, of the curse because He took the curse in our stead, and then He died. So we have no curses once we choose to put them on Yahweh, to put them on Jesus. Then Yahweh died. Now Yahweh did. He went to great lengths to make sure that he stayed away from death. When people died prior to Jesus, whether you were whether you were loyal or not, you went to one place. You went to Sheol. After Jesus, it says those who believe in him to be absent from their bodies, to be present with him. When Moses met Yahweh on the Sinai, Yahweh told him, take off your shoes, you're on holy ground. When Joshua met 
that special individual that is described as Malak Yahweh, the angel of the Lord. Now remember, as I stated in an earlier video, the word angel just means messenger. It's a job. It's a job title. So when Jacob, sorry, when Joshua first met the Malachi Yahweh, the angel of the Lord, before the battle at Jericho, the angel took worship. So it wasn't a normal Elohim. The only Elohim that is loyal to Yahweh that will take worship is Yahweh. So who Joshua met was Yahweh. What did Yahweh tell him? Take off your shoes, you unholy ground in my presence. On the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur every year, the, 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 the high priest that goes into the temple, into the, into the Holy of Holies, he doesn't wear shoes. What's shoes? Shoes is a dead animal. It's, a, it's leather. It's a dead cow. It's a dead animal. All the law, most of the laws of purity of the Old Testament were meant to keep death off of you. You couldn't come into Yahweh's presence with death on you. In their mind, whatever was in the body, if it was leaking out the body, that was death. So if you were bleeding, if you had blood on you, you had death on you. If you, if you were in, in, in contact with a dead body, and was touching a dead body, you had blood, you had death on you. If you were a woman and you were menstruate and you were going through a menstrual cycle, you had death on you. Right? If you recently had sex, you ejaculated, you had death on you. So to come and participate in any of the feasts, etc., in Yahweh's presence, you had to wash. You had to go in a mikvah, out, in a in a bath, in a pool, and wash and purify yourself from death. You could not come into God's presence, into Yahweh's presence with death. Why? Because Yahweh, once he is in the presence of death, will destroy it. So what the rulers of this world did not understand is that if you bring death into God's presence, into Yahweh's presence, he will destroy it. So if they knew this, they would not have crucified Jesus. But they did. So they introduced Jesus to death. And by introducing Jesus to death, he destroyed death, which is why we who choose to believe in him will not taste death. These bodies will get worn out and we'll close our eyes here and wake up or and open them somewhere else in a blink. We'll not taste that. We'll never go to Sheol. We won't do like the people in the Old Testament, like David and Moses and Elijah and, 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 and Amos and Zechariah and go to Sheol. We will close our eyes and to be absent from the bodies, to be present with God until he is ready to bring us all back. So all of these divine rebellions, God is going to fix. So Jesus fixed death from the first rebellion. The second rebellion that led to the onslaught of the sons of the rebellious Elohim on earth. Number one, he's going to destroy those rebellious Elohim and he's going to destroy their offspring, their children, the demons. Only God is going to do that, but only God who is going to be a man. They are imprisoned and they are locked up and they are held at bay, but Christ is coming to destroy them. And finally, he is going to reclaim the nations. The head of all the nations that according to the Bible, are currently divine beings. The rulers of this world, the principalities, powers, and spiritual leaders, and you know, they are all divine beings. The prince of the power of the United States, or the prince of the power of China, or the prince of the power of Angola, they're all divine beings. 
God is going to remove that. And those rulers are going to be men. That is why God decided to take flesh. And Yahweh, the visible Yahweh, will always be a man. He'll always be God, but he's always going to be a man. So, every one of these divine rebellions, Jesus dealt with and fixed. So, that's it for the Divine Rebellion series. Um, I know it was a bit long. Thank you for watching. Like and subscribe. Um, these videos have been a bit long and this one is getting up there. Um, the next three videos I have planned will be, be much shorter. One will be all what the Bible says about heaven, then what the Bible says about hell. But before that, I may do a short video on the Christmas story. So again, like, subscribe, drop me a comment. I'll eventually read all of them. Hope you enjoyed the video. Thank you. God bless you and have a nice day.